From the Tanglewood Tales, The Golden Fleece When Jason, the son of the dethroned king of Iolcus, was a little boy, he was sent away from his parents and placed under the queerest schoolmaster that ever you heard of. This learned person was one of the people, or quadrupeds, called centaurs. He lived in a cavern and had the body and legs of a white horse with the head and shoulders of a man. His name was Chiron, and in spite of his odd appearance, he was a very excellent teacher and had several scholars who afterwards did him credit by making a great figure in the world. The famous Hercules was one, and so was Achilles, and Philatetes likewise, and Aesculapius, who acquired immense repute as a doctor. The good Chiron taught his pupils how to play upon the harp and how to cure diseases and how to use the sword and shield together with various other branches of education in which the lads of those days used to be instructed instead of writing and arithmetic. I have sometimes suspected that Master Chiron was not really very different from other people, but that being a kind-hearted and merry old fellow, he was in the habit of making believe that he was a horse and scrambling about the schoolroom on all fours and letting the little boys ride upon his back. And so, when his scholars had grown up and grown old and were trotting their grandchildren on their knees, they told them about the sports of their school days. And these young folks took the idea that their grandfathers had been taught their letters by a centaur, half man and half horse. Little children not quite understanding what is said to them often get such absurd notions in their heads, you know. Be that as it may, it has always been told for a fact, and always will be told as long as the world lasts, that Chiron, with the head of a schoolmaster, had the body and legs of a horse. Just imagine the grave old gentleman clattering and stamping into the schoolroom on his four hooves, perhaps treading on some little fellow's toes, flourishing his swish tail instead of a rod, and now and then trotting out of doors to eat a mouthful of grass. I wonder what the blacksmith charged him for a set of four iron shoes. So Jason dwelt in the cave with this four-footed Chiron from the time that he was an infant, only a few months old, until he had grown to the full height of a man. He became a very good harper, I suppose, and skillful in the use of weapons, and tolerably acquainted with the herbs and other doctor stuff, and above all, an admirable horseman, for in teaching young people to ride, the good Chiron must have been without rival among schoolmasters. At length, being now a tall and athletic youth, Jason resolved to seek his fortune in the world without asking Chiron's advice or telling him anything about the matter. This was very unwise to be sure, and I hope none of you, my little hearers, will ever follow Jason's example. But you are to understand he had heard how that he himself was a royal prince and how his father, King Aeshan, had been deprived of the kingdom of Iolcus by a certain Peleus, who would also have killed Jason had he not been hidden in the centaur's cave. And being come to the strength of a man, Jason determined to set all this business to rights, and to punish the wicked Peleus for wronging his dear father, and to cast him down from the throne, and seat himself there instead. With this intention, he took a spear in each hand and threw a leopard skin over his shoulders to keep off the rain and set forth on his travels with his long yellow ringlets waving in the wind. The part of his dress on which he most prided himself was a pair of sandals that had been his father's. They were handsomely embroidered and were tied upon his feet with strings of gold. But his whole attire was such as people did not very often see, and as he passed along, the women and children ran to the doors and windows, wondering whether this beautiful youth was journeying with his leopard skin and his gold-tied sandals, and what heroic deeds he meant to perform, with a spear in his right hand and another in his left. I know not how far Jason had traveled when he came to a turbulent river which rushed right across his pathway, with specks of white foam among its black eddies, hurrying tumultuously onward and roaring angrily as it went. Though not a very broad river in the dry seasons of the year, 
It was now swollen by heavy rains and by the melting of the snow on the sides of Mount Olympus, and it thundered so loudly and looked so wild and dangerous that Jason, bold as he was, thought it prudent to pause upon the brink. The bed of the stream seemed to be strewn with sharp and rugged rocks, some of which thrust themselves above the water. By and by, an uprooted tree with shattered branches came drifting along the current and got entangled among the rocks. Now and then, a drowned sheep, and once, the carcass of a cow floated past. In short, the swollen river had already done a great deal of mischief. It was evidently too deep for Jason to wade and too boisterous for him to swim. He could see no bridge, and as for a boat, had there been any, the rocks would have broken it to pieces in an instant. See the poor lad, said a cracked voice close to his side. He must have had but a poor education, since he does not know how to cross a little stream like this. Or is he afraid of wetting his fine golden string sandals? It is a pity his four-footed schoolmaster is not here to carry him safely across on his back. Jason looked around, greatly surprised, for he did not know that anybody was near. But beside him stood an old woman with a ragged mantle over her head, leaning on a staff, the top of which was carved in the shape of a cuckoo. She looked very aged and wrinkled and infirm, and yet her eyes, which were as brown as those of an ox, were so extremely large and beautiful that when they were fixed on Jason's eyes, he could see nothing else but them. The old woman had a pomegranate in her hand, although the fruit was then quite out of season. Whither are you going, Jason? She now asked. She seemed to know his name, you will observe, and indeed, those great brown eyes looked as if they had knowledge of everything, whether past or to come. While Jason was gazing at her, a peacock strutted forward and took his stand at the old woman's side. I'm going to Iolcus, answered the young man, to bid the wicked King Peleus come down from my father's throne and let me reign in his stead. Ah, well then, said the old woman, still with the same cracked voice. If that is all your business, you need not be in a very great hurry. Just take me on your back, there's a good youth, and carry me across the river. I and my peacock have something to do on the other side, as well as yourself. Good mother, replied Jason, your business can hardly be so important as pulling down a king from his throne. Besides, as you may see for yourself, the river is very boisterous, and if I should chance to stumble, it would sweep both of us away more easily than it has carried off yonder uprooted tree. I would gladly help you if I could, but I doubt whether I am strong enough to carry you across. Then, she said very scornfully, Neither are you strong enough to pull King Peleus off his throne. And Jason, unless you will help an old woman at her need, you ought not to be a king. What are kings made for? Save to succor the feeble and distressed. But do as you please. Either take me on your back or with my poor old limbs, I shall try my best to struggle across the stream. Saying this, the old woman poked with her staff in the river as if to find the safest place in its rocky bed where she might make the first step. But Jason, by this time, had grown ashamed of his reluctance to help her. He felt that he could never forgive himself if this poor feeble creature should come to any harm in attempting to wrestle against the headlong current. The good Chiron, whether half horse or no, had taught him that the noblest use of his strength was to assist the weak and also that he must treat every young woman as if she were his sister, and every old one like a mother. Remembering these maxims, the vigorous and beautiful young man knelt down and requested the good dam to mount upon his back. The passage seems to me not very safe, he remarked, but as your business is so urgent, I will try to carry you across the river. If the river sweeps you away, it shall take me too. That, no doubt, will be a great comfort to both of us, quoth the old woman. But never fear, we shall get safely across. And I think we'll pause here and continue with this story in the next video. Thanks so much for listening. Please 
reach down, click like, subscribe if you haven't, and uh, come back and join us next time. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.